Hey everybody, we are into our second month of being quarantined. Congratulations, you've done it. Well, you may not have noticed this because you've been stuck inside, but it's spring. And with spring comes all kinds of different beautiful things. But unfortunately, uh, as we well know, not everything that is beautiful is good. So I got a couple of examples uh, of, for you this morning of things that may be beautiful, but might also be a little bit dangerous. The first one is this, the Venus flytrap. Now I had a, I believe it or not, I had a Venus flytrap uh, as a kid. Um, I saw cartoons and it was awesome because they would jump up and just grab things out of the air. And believe it or not, Venus flytraps in real life don't do that. I, I had to like manually feed my Venus flytrap flies. It was not nearly as fun as you thought it would be. So, but these beautiful plants uh, will actually, actually eat insects that come in and uh, while they are very beautiful, they are also very dangerous. The next one, the Pied Piper. Maybe you remember this story from, from your youth. Uh, uh, this guy who comes and plays beautiful music and the kids just walked away with him. <laughs> and again, like for those of you who have kids in quarantine right now, you're kind of like, man, what's this guy's deal? Who wants to do that? But the, the Pied Piper played beautiful music, but it ended up being very dangerous to the people who listened to it. Next, we have quicksand. Now, apparently quicksand in real life doesn't work like it does on movies, you know, like you, you just get sucked down pretty quick. Uh, quicksand is actually, uh, takes a long time for you to, uh, to get sucked in, but it is very difficult to get, get out and can be very dangerous. The anglerfish, which lives deep in the darkest parts of the ocean, has a glowing antenna that sucks smaller fish in. They, they are attracted to the light. And then the monstrous jaws of the anglerfish chomp down their small little prey. And then we have Hansel and Gretel. Now Hansel and Gretel are, are, are dangerous, but if you remember in the story, uh, they were drawn to the witch's house, which was made entirely of candy. Now, if I'm being honest, I, I don't think I would fall for this ruse. Now, if she had built her house out of French fries, and buffalo wings, yeah, I think she probably would have would have gotten me. But uh, but Hansel and Gretel were tricked into uh, a dangerous situation by something that was very beautiful. Well, Jesus also tells us in the Bible that there were people who were looked beautiful on the outside, but inside were very dangerous. While the religious leaders of Israel may have looked to the Jewish people as models of a right relationship with God. The reality was that they were dangerous to those who followed them. Well, we're going to jump back into Matthew chapter 23. But before we do, I uh, just want to remind you, we are in the final week of Jesus' ministry here on earth before he goes to the cross. It is Wednesday of this week, and Jesus is at the temple, a temple that he had cleared and had repurposed for ministry. A temple that was filled with things being sold was now being filled with healing and teaching. The religious leaders were not pleased at the change in the temple, so they came trying to find a way to trap Jesus in his words. They asked him questions about taxation, the resurrection, uh, about how the commandments should be read. And Jesus, one by one, answered their questions. And then Jesus follows with a question of his own about who the genuine Messiah is. And here at the temple, surrounded by the religious leaders, by his disciples, by all the people who were listening, Jesus launches into his final public sermon as he talks about the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. So if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, we, uh, we had Easter last week, but we're back. We're going to look at the second, second part of what Jesus had to say in this sermon. But we're going to look at Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 to 36 today. Here's what God's word says. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. Which, and when you succeed, you've made them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold 
or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but the inside is full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside will be clean also. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the de descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so, upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berezica, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we consider these powerful words, Lord, I, I pray that you would give us wisdom that comes through your Holy Spirit, that we would hear, understand, and obey. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love, but we also thank you for your honesty and truth. Help us to learn from that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two weeks ago, we looked at the first three of the seven woes that are found here in Matthew chapter 23. Woe number one, Jesus talked about the Pharisees as false teachers. The second woe had to do with the Pharisees as false witnesses. And the third woe was about them not meaning what they said. And what was interesting is Jesus preaches this very public sermon is that Jesus doesn't do this with joy, but with great sadness. He has passed his final judgment on a group of people who should be leading Israel into a right relationship with God, but instead they are leading them far away from where God wants them to be. Well, we're going we're gonna to wrap up our study of these seven woes by looking at woes four through seven today. Woe number four we find in verses 23 and 24 the scribes and Pharisees were focusing on the wrong thing. Look at these verses with me again. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to give you an image. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. And here's what, I, here's what I want you to do. When you see the image, I want you to immediately, and you're in your home, it's okay, you can just shout out the first thing that you see. You're, you ready? All right, here we go. Well, what did you see? Well, for some of you, you saw this image, and the first thing you saw were the trees that are in the middle of the forest. And 
That, that, that's very good. For some of you, uh, you saw something else all, uh, altogether different, uh, perhaps the face of a tiger or a big cat. One of the biggest issues that Jesus had with the scribes and Pharisees was their inability to focus. Our eyes focused immediately on something in that picture. But for the, for the scribes and Pharisees, they had a problem focusing on what mattered most when it came to following God. In Leviticus chapter 27, we read this. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the tree, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. In the Mosaic law, people were commanded to give a tithe or 10% of their finances and of what they grew to the Lord. And for the religious leaders, they took this command incredibly seriously. Not only did they give 10% of the money that they made, but also of what they grew as well. And not just what was in the field, but also the things that they grew in their own home. Now here I have a peppermint plant. Um, and, and back in Jesus' time, many of you grow house plants, uh, and uh, people in Jesus' time would grow these small house plants uh, that would serve as spices and stuff like that. Well, not only did the religious leaders give 10% of what grew in their field, but they would actually go around their house when their house plants were in season. And like with this peppermint plant, they would count each and every leaf that was on the plant. And then, when it came time to tithe, they would pick one out of every ten leaves and tithe that tiny little leaf, or if for some of these plants, the seeds that were in them, to the Lord as a way of making sure that they gave exactly 10%. Now, Jesus' issue here isn't what they did. It was actually what they neglected. While they were incredibly meticulous with things like house plants, they miss some very big things that God said were even more important. Listen to what is, uh, he says here. He says, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So while the religious leaders were picking leaves and seeds, there was a lack of justice going on in, in Israel. People were not receiving mercy when it was needed, and there was a lack of faithfulness. God says, listen. That's fine that you're picking leaves and counting seeds, but these things matter even more. A, a few weeks ago, we talked about how the Pharisees would of, often argue with one another because they believed that different commands were weightier or meant more than others. Here, Jesus uses their, his, their own terminology against them when he says, you have neglected the more important, and some translations have, the weightier things in the law. Jesus says, listen, caring for others is more important than leaves and seeds. Bringing justice to the people is more valuable in the eyes of God. Should they have known this? Well, in Micah, in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, we read this. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Interestingly enough, in verse 23, Jesus points out that there's nothing wrong with what they were doing. The fact that they were counting leaves and being meticulous in their giving to God is fine. It's a perfectly good thing. If they wanted to count seeds and leaves out of their love for God, by all means do it, but not while they're neglecting the other things that God had asked them to do. Look at verse 24 with me. Let me read this to you. He says, You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but you swallow a camel. This is a re actually a really funny statement that Jesus makes in the middle of a very heavy passage. And, and it's interesting because of the two animals that he uses here, a gnat and a camel. In Leviticus chapter 11, we get a list of the unclean animals that Jews were not allowed to eat. The smallest animal that's listed in Leviticus chapter 11 is the gnat. And the largest is the camel. Jesus' point here is that, listen, you guys spend all your time focusing on the minuscule and you miss the huge. 
The Pharisees, believe it or not, even took this to an extreme. While the Pharisees would drink wine, they would oftentimes drink their wine with clenched teeth so as not to inadvertently swallow a gnat and make themselves unclean. So I'm going to try this for you guys. I got my cup of water here. I'm going to try to drink with clenched teeth. Here we go. That's a huge mess. Anyway, I'm sure they were much better at it than I, than I am. But again, the point of it is this. Jesus is again saying that they're focused on the wrong things. They put so much effort into the tiny things that they leave these large areas that God cares deeply about undone. Well, the question is, do we do this today? Yeah, sometimes I think we do. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, Paul writes this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul's point here is exactly the same that Jesus is making to the Pharisees. We can do many things, but if we do not have a right relationship with God, if we don't have love for the things that God loves, all our stuff means very little. Well, Jesus doesn't stop there when it comes to the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. Woe number five and six focuses on the inside, and Jesus telling them that the inside matters most. Jesus combines the fifth and sixth woe here to the scribes and Pharisees to focus on their view of the inside. Look at verses 25 and 26 with me. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside will be clean also. Well, I have a bowl here, and let me ask you a question. Now, I know we're, we're living in a time where we're caring a great deal about cleanliness. We're wiping everything down, making sure everything. But let's pretend for a second that you only had the ability to clean one part of this dish. You can clean the inside of the dish or the outside of the dish. Now, which part would you say is more important to clean? I'm hoping you said the inside. Why? Why is the inside more important to clean than the outside? Because the inside is where the food goes, right? So if I'm having a bowl of cereal, I, I think I'd rather have the inside clean than the outside. If I'm having soup or something else, I don't want my food sitting on a bunch of uncleanliness. And this is the point that Jesus makes with the religious leaders here. Jesus cares about us being clean from the inside out. Should the Pharisees have known this? Yeah, they were experts in the Old Testament. And look at what this says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God is talking about David here, and David was known as a man after God's own heart. And it wasn't because of David's physical appearance. It wasn't because of the great works that he did, but it was because of his passion and genuine love for the Lord. The Pharisees spent nearly all their time on the external when they should have spent time knowing and loving God deeply. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The religious leaders want to know and see God, right? And God says, and Jesus himself says here, the ones who see God are the ones that have a pure heart. Again, it is about the inside. Well, Jesus continues to build on, on this idea in his next one. Look at verses 27 and 28. 
Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. In New Testament times, during the month of Adar, which is roughly our March, uh, the people of Israel would begin to whitewash their community. They would whitewash their houses, their walls, and especially the tombs. Now, this community paint job that we, they would do was for an important reason. Uh, Passover was, was coming up very soon, and uh, in most towns in Israel, these, these towns and cities would be filled with travelers during during Passover. And, and it was also very important and especially important that the tombs be well marked. So one of the things that the people would do besides the houses and the walls is they would paint and mark out the tombs. Because unlike us, we usually have cemeteries where all of our dead are. Uh, in Israel, the the tombs of, of loved ones who were passed away were, were pretty pretty much everywhere. And as travelers were coming into the city, if they were to place their hand on a tomb, they would become ceremonially unclean. Now, this would be a great tragedy. Here are these people that are coming to celebrate the Passover, and because they accidentally touched an unclean tomb, they would be unable to take part in the Passover. Now, think about this. Has anything actually changed with the tomb because they put paint on it? No, of course not. And Jesus' point here is that even though the tomb had been freshly cleaned, and, and had anything actually changed with the tomb itself? No, it was still filled with the remains of dead people. The same was true for the scribes and Pharisees. On the outside, everything looked all right. But inside, they were still filled with all kinds of uncleanness. They had their robes, they had their beards, they had their, they had their phylacteries, and they made themselves look great. But Jesus said, inside, you're full of all kinds of uncleanliness. Well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, last week was Easter, and uh, we, we did have a family Easter egg hunt, and I got a couple eggs left over, so I thought I would... Uh, uh, I thought I would open them with you. Uh, we, we love doing Easter eggs because you never know what you're going to find inside. Um, so let's, let's open a couple of these. Let's uh, see what we got. First one, ooh, this one's jingling. All right, we got some money. That's right. Ooh, we got some quarters. So we're doing all right. That's great. Let's see what else we got. Ooh, this one's pretty. Oh, Snickers bar, yay! I'll eat this later, but uh, awesome. Sometimes you get candy, sometimes you get money. Ooh, what's in here? Oh, it, it's really old broccoli. It's not nice when something that is beautiful on the outside is filled with something so disgusting and rancid on the inside, which was Jesus' point. These people knew that God cared about the inside. They also believed that this life was not the end. The Pharisees, unlike the Sadducees and, and others, believed that there was a resurrection to come. In other words, this life that they were living, they knew that it wasn't the end. Yet they spent the vast majority of their time focused on the outward and not nearly enough focusing on the eternal. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. Paul says, listen, focus not on things that are passing away, but on things that last forever. Our relationship with Christ, our heart for the people that God loves, 
are eternal things. The external, it comes and goes. The internal lasts forever. The final woe that Jesus deals with here is found in verses 29 to 36, and it was the religious leader's superiority to others. Look at verses 29 and 30. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had not, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Over the years, Jerusalem had become filled with monuments and tombs for the Old Testament prophets. The scribes and Pharisees were very quick to condemn the other generations that had preceded them for not listening to the messengers that God had sent to them. Does that ring ironic to you as I, as I say that? Because it should, because it's exactly what the scribes and Pharisees are doing right now. They have the messenger of God, God's own son, standing right before them, and what are they in the process of doing? Rejecting it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14, we read this. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. They are literally doing the very thing that they condemn the previous generations of doing. We see this happen all the time in our own world. I, I constantly hear people who are appalled by things that have happened in the past. If I had lived back then, I would have never let that happen. But the reality is, there's sin in every generation. There are injustice in every generation. And while we, don't, while we don't stand for that, and while we try and fix what it is, the reality is, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Have people in previous generations made mistakes? Absolutely. Are people in future generations going to make mistakes? Absolutely. Are people, in, people living right now making mistakes? Oh, yeah. So where does this attitude of superiority from, come from? When we see ourselves as better, smarter, and more important than others? Well, it doesn't come from God. How does God tell us that, to view others? Well, Philippians 2, verses 3 to 5 say this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. God hasn't called us to look down on others, but to see them as more valuable and more important than ourselves. Clearly, the Pharisees have missed this. Well, after laying out seven, uh, seven woes, seven areas of gross hypocrisy, Jesus finishes with this in verse 33. He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Well, the reality is they, they don't. They are... Uh, Church history tells us, and even biblical history tells us, that many of them would perish with their sin. Interestingly enough, he calls them snakes, which I think we can understand. He calls them a brood or a group of vipers. We're not quite as familiar with vipers, uh, but vipers were very common and very dangerous in Israel. These small brown snakes were highly poisonous and would often lie very still on the ground. So when someone went out to gather sticks or sent one of their children out to gather sticks for a fire, uh, oftentimes these vipers would lay on the ground very still. And when they, were, when they go to pick them up, they would get a powerful and deadly strike. Jesus said the scribes and the Pharisees were like these deadly animals. They were not going to escape judgment. And sadly, they were going to draw many towards it who followed them. Well, the question I want to ask you is the same one I asked you two weeks ago. After two weeks of looking at how the scribes and Pharisees failed, the question that remains for us is, are we a Pharisee or are we a follower of Jesus? 
Look at verses 37 to 39 with me. Jesus wraps up this chapter by saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Interestingly enough, this would be the last confrontation that Jesus would have with the religious leaders and his last public message to the people of Israel before his death and resurrection. The religious leaders and the people of Israel stood face to face with the Messiah. They heard his preaching, they saw his healing, and they missed it. We can be in the presence of of Jesus Christ week after week, and believe it or not, we can miss him. Clearly, we don't want to make the same mistakes that were made here. Are you following a religion, or are you following Jesus? These passages make it very clear that our relationship with Jesus Christ isn't about following a bunch of rules. It's about following the one true Messiah. Jesus put a high priority on that, and the Pharisees missed it. And many of the people of Israel missed it. I hope you don't. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to look into your word and to be challenged by the powerful words of Jesus here. Because, Lord, we do not want to be on the receiving end of what he has to say here. But, Lord, you are merciful and forgiving. So, Lord, if we have erred in this way, Lord, help us to repent, to turn and go a different direction, to follow you, and to become a true follower of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.